your man, Louis T. Welcome to this Louis T. Network exclusive limited series, The Reign of Terror, chronicling the 23 years of pure hell Daniel Snyder has put this fan base through. I, of course, am your set man, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. We are now on chapter 13. All right, and this brings us to the 2011 season. You're coming off of a disappointing 6 and 10 campaign that started off with such promise with Donovan McNabb at the helm. The season ended up being a disaster. McNabb ultimately got benched. McNabb then gets traded in the offseason to the Minnesota Vikings for a six round pick. And so um, you're moving on. And it looks like it's going to be John Beck versus Rex Grossman in terms of a quarterback competition in the summer and I can tell you that I'm not sure that there's ever been a more underwhelming quarterback competition in NFL history but somehow I managed to get excited about it we'll put a pin in that we'll come back later so the offseason was actually an interesting one you're in year two of the Mike Shanahan era in Washington um, you're seeing the roster turnover Washington went out and signed a couple of NFC East foes uh, in the offseason on the defensive line. Uh, Stephen Bowen came in here and helped. Uh, Barry Cofield came in from New York. Um, Bowen came from Dallas. And so you were remaking that defensive line. They had signed Adam Carricker the year before. Um, <clears throat> you bring in Josh Wilson in the secondary at cornerback. OJ uh, Otagwe came in here, I want to say in 2010, the first year of Shanahan and so you were remaking the roster right reshaping the way things looked obviously offensively things looked drastically different this was a much different team there was no more Clinton Portis on this roster uh, Chris Cooley was on his last legs Trent Williams was a guy that was just selected the year before he would get suspended in 2010 his first infraction Fred Davis would be suspended in 2010 as well for weed just like Trent Williams and so a um, lot of interesting things and dynamics going on, but I really felt in the moment, and I, I am guilty. All right, I'll put my hand up. I'm guilty. I really thought in the moment that the 2011 draft was going to be a foundational draft for Washington um, because they didn't take a quarterback, which was the right thing to do. I thought it was one of the worst quarterback drafts in recent memory. At that time, in that moment, not, you know, looking back on it 10 years later thinking it was a terrible draft. No, I knew right then and there, and Washington did as well. That's why they didn't take a quarterback and actually moved out of a spot to allow Jacksonville to trade up to get Blaine Gabbert. Remember, we could have traded. I mean, we could have gotten J.J. Watt. Now, we didn't know at the time. None of us did. If teams would have known, he wouldn't have got, gotten all the way to number 11, where he ended up being selected, I believe. Whatever the case may be. We traded out of the 10th overall pick. I think it was the 10th overall pick. Allowed Jacksonville to come up to select Blaine Gabbert. It was 10 or 11. We moved back and we selected Ryan Kerrigan. So I thought this was going to be a foundational draft because we picked up so many picks and it allowed us to be in a really good position. And, and I thought this was a really good draft at the time in the moment. Listen to the names in this draft. So you get Kerrigan, which we know turned out to be one of the you know best Redskin players of the last decade. You get Jarvis Jenkins. You get Leonard Hankerson, Roy Hallou Jr., Evan Royster, Niles Paul, Dejon Gomes, Aldrick Robinson, Chris Neal. I'm probably forgetting a name or two in that draft. But look, I just named like eight or nine guys, right? And in some way, shape, or form, those guys that I just named were contributors, Right on this football team, Audrick Robinson had a fantastic 2012 season. Niles Paul was one of those linchpin type of players for us moving forward. I mean, I thought Hank was gonna be good. It was Hank time. <laughs> oh man, Roy Hallou Jr. I, I we ran him into the ground with all you know the dump downs and things of that nature. He used to get on my nerves because he didn't pick up his feet because he was fast, but you never really got to see the speed, unfortunately. Evan Royster, I thought, was a nice, slick, you know, ver uh, 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 I thought a downgraded version of Ryan Terrain, maybe a little bit smoother than Ryan Terrain. I thought Terrain was more mechanical in his movements, but I thought Evan Royster was another type of Ryan Terrain uh, back. And we, look, at that time, 
the Shanahan's were taking anything at the running back position and turning it into a thousand yard rusher. So I was like, one of these du- two dudes they took in the draft at running back is going to end up being really good for us. Um, so I thought that was a foundation type of draft. And unfortunately, Jarvis Jenkins tore his ACL and never really was what we wanted him to be. Hank never turned into what we thought he was going to turn into in this league. Uh, Jarvis or, or uh, Aldrick Robinson, he showed flashes and, and actually had a really solid NFL career. Made some plays here, you know. Um, Dejon Gomes never really truly worked out. Uh, Evan Royster had his moments, just like Roy Hulu had his moments here. Niles Paul was, again, a linchpin type of guy. So, you know, Chris Neal had some injuries or else he might have been really good. I always remember Tom Lavero talking about the Pocono Punisher, you know. So um, I was excited about the 11 draft, not necessarily the season, right? But you get into the um, camp. And it's Beck versus Grossman. <laughs> and let me tell you, I found myself entrenched in this this quarterback competition somehow, some way. I don't know how I allowed myself to feel like this was even worth giving any time, energy, or effort to. But um, somehow I found myself, you know, rooting for John Beck. Because I knew what, I, I think it was a lot like, Ryan Fitzpatrick and Taylor Heineke in Fitzpatrick's only year here. I already knew what Fitzpatrick was. I wanted to see what Heineke could be. I already knew what Rex Grossman was as a quarterback by the time he got here to Washington. I didn't need to see him for a full season as the starter. I wanted to see what John Beck had, right? My dad looked me in my eyes and he told me, John Beck, and, you know, he's from the islands. John Beck is garbage. So he looked me in my eyes and he told me John Beck is garbage. I wasn't trying to hear it. And um, there's a song, you know, called uh, Johnny Be Good. And so in the preseason, when John Beck would get in and he would, you know, have a completion, I would sing the song. I said, oh, go Johnny. Johnny be good tonight. Yeah, yeah, go Johnny, Johnny be good. So every time he would, you know, make a play, I would say, I said, oh, go Johnny. My dad would look over at me with this disgusting look like, you idiot. (laughs) He knew, my dad knew. He had watched enough football to know. And I, deep down inside, I knew too. I knew too. I was, when you're a fan of this team, Sometimes you psych yourself up. And that's what probably a lot of people think we're doing right now with Sam Howell. You know, you convince yourself. This is different. I couldn't tell you John Beck, uh, Adam from Eve. I couldn't tell you who John Beck was before he got here. I didn't know the story of him being in Baltimore. I couldn't tell you that he was at BYU or any of that stuff. I didn't know John Beck. I know Sam Howell. I've watched his career. I couldn't tell you anything about John Beck. So, anyway, um... Grossman wins the battle, and off we go into the regular season. Um, the battle, I, you can call it that. It was terrible. Um, but Grossman was declared the victor. He started off the season. We win week one. That's the game against the Giants. Ryan Kerrigan in his first NFL game bats the ball in the air, picks it off, and goes to the crib with it against Eli Manning. Uh, I mean, how can you have a better debut than that, right? Uh, we win that game. We double them up. Uh, I remember Grossman throwing a fade route in that game. I can't remember to who for a touchdown. Probably Santana, if I had to guess. I, I couldn't tell you who he threw it to. But I just remember us winning that game and thinking, okay, that's a great start. But uh, we'll see what happens. So you get to week two. And I'll never forget this because uh, my barber had a wedding that day. And I was so mad. I was furious at him. I'm like, how could you schedule? Like, you're a football fan just like me. How could you schedule a wedding in week two? You had all off season to schedule a wedding. You're going to wait till the beginning of September. Are you insane? But I couldn't not be there to support. <clears throat> so I went and I missed the entire second half of the game. 
you know, but, you know, I was able to record it. It wasn't a big deal, but it was a big deal because I like to watch it live. But I just remembered following the game on my phone, you know, getting all these updates, hoping that we, we find a way to win. We were down 21 to 13, and I'm thinking, we're going to lose the game. And we score the touchdown, cut it to 21-19. We go for two. Uh, we don't get it. And um, I remember thinking, we're going to lose. We're going to lose. And then we get the football back. Kick a field goal. Graham Gano uh, kicks a field goal. F- matter of fact, I think we went for it on fourth down, as a matter of fact. And Santana catches a, a touchdown pass to give us the lead um, or to, to cut it to a two-point game. We go for it. We don't get it. And then we we ended up getting the ball back, going back down the field, getting in field goal range. The Cardinals do get the ball back. They got a chance to beat us. They They turn it over. They fumble. We recover and we win the game 22 to 21. And I just remember being so excited that we start the season off 2 0. Who would have thought Rex Grossman would be? And, and remember, you know, he talked about winning the NFC East in, in the offseason, right? He's like, hey, nobody's paying attention to us. That's great. Uh, they'll pay attention when we win the NFC East. So he was talking big cash, right? It's hard, cold, hard cash money in the offseason. And we're 2 0. I'm like, okay, Rex, maybe he knew something. <clears throat> One thing Rex Grossman never lacked was confidence. So you could always count on Rex. Rex could throw three picks, look you dead in your eyes, and say, hey, the next one's going to be a touchdown. We all know somebody like that. Anyway, um, week three, uh, we, we suffered our first defeat of the season. Um, and what what a frustrating way to lose. It was Dallas, in Dallas, on a Monday night. What did I tell you? We used to always play Dallas on some form of primetime television, either Sunday night, Monday night. Now the new thing is Thanksgiving, right? So we go to Dallas week three, and Tony Romo's banged up. He's always banged up. So he, he's, his ribs are in terrible condition and shape. They don't know if he's going to play. He plays, and it's so frustrating because they don't, score a single touchdown in the game they kicked six field goals and i will never forget this game how do you lose to six field goals and the the play that sticks out remember i i I told you guys that i couldn't stand jim Haslett because he was over aggressive there's there's a, a middle ground right there's a median somewhere in the middle right jim Haslett was all the way at the blitz happy aggressive end of the spectrum and there was no middle for him so the Cowboys all night long that night had issues snapping the ball I don't know who their center was but Tony Romo was trying not to get hit this center was snapping the ball all over the place and we ended up getting them in like a third and 24 some foolishness like that late in the game we we take the lead um 18 it's 16 to 15 and we've got the lead and all we have to do is get a stop and it's third and like 24 after a poor snap and Kerrigan knocks him down and I'm thinking we got him like they haven't done anything really all night long in terms of explosives other than the run right like everything we've kept in front of us Romo's hurting. He can't, you know, he's not in sync with his receivers. It was a mess of a game for both teams, but they had an excuse. Their starting quarterback, you know, wasn't healthy and, you know, their center couldn't snap the ball three times in a row without making some kind of mistake. So Rex was just funky. He was just turning it over and doing stupid shit. That, anyway, it's third and 24 and Jim Hazlitt sends the kitchen sink. Cover zero. All right, we're rushing like seven dudes on this play, maybe eight, depending on how many guys Dallas sent out in the route. If they sent out four, then we rushed seven. If they sent out three, then we rushed eight. Whatever it was, we came with everybody. Romo rolls out to his right, stops, plants, and he doesn't even stop and plant. I think he ends up rolling out to his right and, Finding Des Bryant, open D'Angelo Hall in coverage, and what are we doing? They need 25 yards for a first down. 
They get the first down. I knew we were going to lose then. Once you give that up, you, you can't recover from that. They get in the field goal range. Um, they make the field goal. We get the football back with the chance. Of course, we're not going to score. Um, Rex, God, he got on my nerves. He rolls out to his left. And he looks, it's, it's crazy. He checks behind him as he's running, right? I remember this because I remember being so pissed because I'm like, bro, you just checked your rear view mirror. You see the defender coming and you, you're still trying to haphazardly run. Like either you're going to run or you're going to throw it. You can't do both. And so he's kind of doing this sideways run shuffle like he's going to try to throw it. And the defender comes from behind, hits him. Ball comes out, Cowboys recover, and that's the end of the game. And you lose to the Cowboys. They don't score a touchdown. They kick six field goals, and you lose 18-16 to 16 on a Monday night to a, a broken-up Tony Romo and a center that couldn't snap the ball without making a mistake. I remember being nauseous that night. And I remember my dad saying, y'all is garbage. I can't believe y'all let us beat y'all. Ain't no way. Six field goals? Y'all is trash. And I just sat there. He went upstairs, gave me the remote, went upstairs. I just sat there like in disbelief. There was, we were 2-0. and There was no way this Cowboys team was going to beat us. Not with Romo banged up. I, and I, I couldn't tell you that the center was going to have a meltdown that night. I just knew Romo was banged up. Anyway, uh, you beat the hapless Rams the next week, but Rex Grossman was awful. We won that game in spite of him, okay? He threw two picks in that game. If not for Ryan Terrain going off, we lose that game, okay? This guy's trash. Put John Beck in already, you know, but you can't. You're 3-1. and one. You're not benching the, the starting quarterback of a 3-1 and one team. So we, we hit the bye. We come off the bye, and this game was so comical. It's the Eagles, and the Eagles are stinking it up. That year, yeah. Vic's the starting quarterback, um, and they've gotten off to a rough start. They come to FedEx. We're leading the division. Eagles at the time are the worst team in the division, and they're one and four. We're three and one, and Rex Grossman wets the bed. He throws three interceptions, all to the same guy, <laughs> all to the same guy. Uh, the, the Eagles had a safety. Um, Damn, I can't remember his name. Picked him off three times. And the one that sticks out to me, because after this one, I wanted him benched. So I think at halftime, we were down like 17-0. The Eagles were giving us work. And LeRon Landry hits Michael Vick, injures him, knocks him out of the game temporarily. Vince Young comes in. Remember, this is the Dream Team Eagles in 2011, if your, your memory doesn't serve you correct. This is the Dream Team Eagles we're talking about here. So this is 2011. So Vince Young comes into the game for Michael Vick. So Vince Young promptly comes in and throws a pick to D'Angelo Hall. And Hall returns it inside the Eagles 20-yard line. We're in business. You're thinking we're about to score. We're going to get in this game. We're going to have a chance, right? Let's, let's see if what the Eagles do when they start to hear some footsteps. I, th I swear it's the next play. Rex gives it right back to him. Right back to him. Throws a pick to the same damn safety. That's his second pick of the game. I said, Mike, bench his ass. Take him out now. I want to see what John Beck has. Take him out. Leave him in the game. He throws another pick to the same safety. I'm like, get him out. And he finally benches him. Of course, we lose the game. So we're three and two, and the next week, it, it, this is when the season just turns comical, right? So I'm excited. We're heading to Carolina. John Beck, this is Rivera's first year in Carolina. Okay, this is rookie Cam Newton, all of that good stuff, okay? So um, the Panthers are not good. That, that is what I am trying to convey to you, okay? The, the Panthers are not a good football team at this current juncture. So, um You go to Carolina, and they beat us up pretty good. And John Beck stinks. <laughs> and I think he threw, I think he threw like two picks in the game, maybe three. Uh, it was not any better than Rex. And at that moment, I think I realized, shit. 
someone had once told me, a wise man once told me, if you have two quarterbacks, you have no quarterbacks. I think it was at that moment in week seven, six or seven, where I realized, damn, we don't have a quarterback. Rex stinks, John Beck stinks. It was confirmed the following week at Buffalo. <clears throat> this game was in Canada. This is the worst watching experience I've ever had as a Redskins fan. And I've had some bad ones. This is the worst. Over in Canada, against the Bills, we get shut out. And, you know, people will talk about swinging, you know, swinging gate. People will talk about the Monday Night Massacre. You can talk about all those games. This was the worst for me because there was no hope. We didn't score a point. There's nothing worse than getting shut out. We didn't get shut out in Swinging Gate. We didn't get shut out against the Patriots 52-7, to although we almost did. We didn't get shut out against the Eagles in the Monday Night Massacre. We got shut out in this game. And again, as I mentioned to you, all those teams that I just mentioned, with the, probably with the exception of the Eagles, even though they were really good that year, um, with Vic, Vic you know, was probably comeback player of the year. Vic was outstanding that year. That was a potent offense. The Patriots were the greatest offense we had ever seen in NFL history. And um, the swing gate was one to forget. That was more about us than it was about the, the, the Giants. Um, and, and the Cowboys, you know, could score when we got beat 56 to 14. But again, that was more about us than it was about the Cowboys. But still, uh, uh, there are a lot of bad games. You know, I think that might have been the worst that I've watched because we had no hope on offense. The Giants game, you know, in, in 2018 was pretty bad too. But um, we go to Canada and John Beck is awful. He looks scared. The, the moment is way too big for him. He is so flustered. You can tell that this NFL quarterback thing, probably not for him. Probably not for him. So, and the Bills weren't even all that good. You know, that's the part that made it. Anytime you get beat up like that and dominated by a team that's not very good, you feel some type of way about it. So I just remember saying, man, I, this the rest of this season is going to be painful. And it was. Um, the, the next week was only significant because we played the 49ers and Roy Hallou set the Washington Redskins record for most receptions in the game because John Beck checked it down to him every opportunity that he got. He ended the game with like 14 catches. Excuse me, which is ridiculous for a running back. Um, at that at that point, I was like, "You have to bench this guy. He's awful." He did get a garbage time touchdown and cut it to one score game, and so I was like, "That's that bullshit's gonna give him another opportunity the next week," and I think it did. And then he went out and he stunk it up again, and then he got benched and. They brought back Rex, and it wasn't any better. And, and so th that's the way the season went. The only significant game that remained on the schedule for me that I even really choose to remember is the second-to-last game of the season. We played the Minnesota Vikings, and the only significance there wasn't anything to do with Washington. Adrian Peterson tore his ACL that day and then came back the next season and rushed for over 2,000 yards. That is the greatest ACL recovery I've ever seen in my life. That's the greatest recovery from an ACL injury that we'll ever see. I'm going to go on a record and say that right now. You will never see someone come back and be superhuman the way Adrian Peterson did. And I remember the conversation after Adrian Peterson tore his ACL because people started talking about the surface at FedEx Field. And boy, would we learn about that surface the next year, right? So that was the reason that was so significant is because Adrian Peterson comes to Washington, tears his ACL on a surface that a lot of people think is trash, and then boy, would we find out about that surface a year later, and would it change and alter the path of this franchise for at least the next five to six years. So anyway, I digress. 2011 was a disaster, but it was a necessary disaster. We finished the season 5-11. and 11. It puts us right in a position... At the time, going into 2012, I thought it was the strongest quarterback draft class that we had seen in quite some time. And that is the year I started this channel, 2012. And I started a series called The Starting Five, and it was the five quarterbacks that I chose to follow in that 2012 draft 
because it was such a strong draft class. And, and that's where I'm going to stop. That's where I'm going to leave you. As we head into 2012 season, Washington with the sixth pick overall. I'll tell you where my mind was and what I was thinking and how things turned out. But phew, that 2012 season, you already know. You already know what that 2012 season was all about. Anyway, that's going to do it for me, your man Louis T, here on the Reign of Terror. Chronicling the 23 years of pure hell that Daniel Snyder has put this franchise through. Until next time, I'm your man Louis T, signing off. Have a good one. Louis T.